Hello, and welcome to May Day Monday. I'm Bobby Halton, and I'm going to do a brief introduction for our host, Tony Carroll. Tony has been doing the May Day Mondays for several years now uh, with fire engineering, and before that with his department, DC Fire, in our nation's capital. Tony's an accomplished firefighter who's taught and spoken literally all over the globe. Um, he has tremendous insight. And today's guest, John Sullivan from Worcester Fire Department, is a man who needs literally no introduction. John's been out speaking and teaching. He's been an icon of the American Fire Service for the last 20 years um, with his presentations and his writings. So we're very, very blessed to have such an amazing uh, team uh, to, to uh, help us see through the incredible tragedy that uh, Worcester experienced um, at that uh, cold storage warehouse fire. And it was no, the department is no stranger to tragedy and it is no stranger to excellence either. Uh, they have continually faced tremendous adversity and they've always faced it with composure, with forthrightness, with courage, compassion, and they've done incredible good for the American Fire Service by that model of leadership. And it's been a town that has never been at lack for great leaders. And today, John's going to let us know about uh, some of the men who we lost that day and their lives. And he's also going to talk to us about some of the incredible leaders that saw the department through that incredible evening, but then through the next few years of healing and recovery. And so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And as always, Fire Engineering wants to thank Tony for his efforts. Putting together the May Day Mondays each week is no small task, but then Tony took upon this task of giving you an audible and visual and first person account of, of a tragedy in the fire service from which we can learn, we can memorialize, and hopefully we can become better and more prepared. So ladies and gentlemen, our host for the evening, Chief Tony Carroll. Hey, thanks a lot, Bobby. It's, um, I'm, great to, I'm grateful that you come on today and, and introduce it. Um, I appreciate you not talking about my, uh, my hair uh, my kids, my kids uh, mentioned that that uh, you picked on the the hair thing. Um, I did uh, get a fresh shave for the event. Um, no hat, so um, you know. Hopefully, it won't distract you. But I do want to get get going. Uh, this uh, I really appreciate it again. Last month, last month we did um, the first the, the inaugural May Day Monday podcast. We talked uh, to uh, Pete Van Dorp, uh, retired from the Chicago Fire Department. Um, I thought it was great. We learned a lot about uh, Herbie Johnson, who passed away in that incident. We learned about the, the Chicago Fire Department. We learned about the incident. Hopefully, you guys took away a skill drill you could use. I know um, I did. A, I burned up a couple doll houses over the month. Um, and if you did, if you were able to, please send me some pictures of you and your crew doing that. Um, again, if, if you didn't build one, but you but you looked at a video or something. That's great. Just get something out of uh, the May Day Monday podcast because, um, again, this is um, do, do this so that we can provide, we can learn from these these things that happen. The best thing we can do to honor these guys um, is to is to practice, to learn from that, and hopefully, um, you know, avoid a avoid a repeat or um, you know emphasize a, a skill or drill. So, again, this month, yes, uh, December December third, right? December third is the uh, anniversary of uh, the, the Worcester Cold Storage and Warehouse uh, fire. It took the lives of uh, six firefighters from Worcester, Massachusetts. I know uh, I was in the fire service then, and, and in fact, that weekend, uh, a friend of mine, we were doing a, a May Day class, a firefighter survival class, and it was just, um, it, was, uh, it was crazy to, to see these numbers coming in about firefighters who were, who were uh, lost in this blaze. And uh, we really wanted to make sure that we uh, learn from this thing and, and um, honor those that, that did. Um, John Sullivan's with us. Um, we made connection. A good friend of, 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 of a uh, fellow friend uh, got us connected here. Uh, Bonzo's a, a Fairfax County guy, and um, he's one of those guys that I feel smart for having him on my phone, right? For having him as a just as a contact. Uh, Bonzo's like a, he's a nurse, he's a retired chief, he's still, still doing, involved in a fire service, and he knows John Sullivan. So I called, called Bonzo, he's like, yeah, I'll hook you up, and, and we did. So, John, thank you for coming on. You want to say uh, a little word about yourself? Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Tony, for having me, and uh, Bobby, uh, Chief Halton, and I have known each other for a number of years now as well, and uh, 
Uh, thanks, Fire Engineering, for uh, putting this together and uh, having uh, me on to uh, discuss the cold storage fire. Um, my uh, career started in Worcester back in 1987, uh, and uh, at the time uh, of the fire in two, uh, 1999, I was a lieutenant on Engine 3. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always say when I do my uh, talks around the country, around the world, that uh, I'm part of a club I don't want to belong to. Uh, and that's to be an officer who lost men in the line of duty. Uh, I know those folks who are uh, uh, watching, there's some of those folks who are in the same boat as a company officer. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work with chief officers who lose men in the line of duty, but the company officer is one of those pieces that's uh, uh, sometimes overlooked. And, uh, you know, I was in that in, in, in enviable position back in 1999. I arrived on scene with five uh, firefighters, uh, four and myself, and uh, by the end of the night, uh, there were only three of us. And uh, we could talk a little bit about how that happened. Uh, uh, I was able to rise through the ranks in Worcester uh, for 30 years uh, to uh, Deputy Chief of Operations. Uh, and uh, two and a half years ago, um, I left Worcester uh, to become the Chief uh, of Department in Brookline, uh, right outside of Boston. Uh, so. I'm in the metro Boston area now and have been the chief there for a little over two and a half years uh, and uh, am, uh, and really uh, enjoying uh, the position as chief of the department and uh, the members of that department as well as uh, getting to know uh, all the members of the metro Boston area. Uh, but I still have my roots here in Worcester. I still live in Worcester. Uh, I commute down to Boston area every day uh, for that job and uh, it's been a as everybody else has seen, it's been a challenge this last year with this uh, pandemic situation. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, we're uh, you know we're uh, grateful that uh, uh, we we've got uh, you know we've got a great crew down there as well as the crew here in Worcester is uh, they're doing a fantastic job here. Even though you know, as Bobby noted, over the last couple of years we've had some setbacks with uh, the loss of uh, Jason Menard last year, and then uh, two years ago. Uh, another brother was lost just about the exact same time and uh, uh, on Lowell Street. And so uh, we celebrate their lives as well tonight, as well as those, those of, uh, of the six who died in 1999. So I thought that, um, that that whole area was like the metro area. Is Worcester, how far is Worcester from Boston? So Worcester's 40 miles due west uh, in the center of the state. We're kind of an enclave all to our own out there. There's no other major cities around us. Uh, we have a number of small bedroom communities that surround Worcester. Uh, there are some full-time fire departments uh, now. Uh, when I first came on the job, uh, there were there was only one or two that were full-time, and there was just a handful of folks back then. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's it's built up over the years. We've we've kind of become a suburb of Boston in a in a way, uh, in, in that uh, we have commuter rail now from uh, the MBTA that connects Boston to Worcester and. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we've kind of built out the Boston area to Worcester, uh, but it's still pretty much an enclave to itself out there. Uh, the two departments don't have really much to do with each other in, in terms of that. But Boston was very instrumental in 1999 with their tech rescue folks to come help us. Uh, as Bobby well remembers, and you too, Tony, I'm sure that um, we had eight days of recovery just to get the uh, bodies from the building and then another six days of uh, funerals and wakes uh, to uh, put our brothers to uh, rest. And, uh, you know, so all in all, this wasn't, uh, you know, what we're used to, which is, you know, we go to the fire, we put it out, we go home, we pack up, you know, we, we clean up and we're off to the next thing the next day. This was 14 days of, uh, you know, uh, living this uh, through this uh, nightmare of uh, losing six uh, brothers in one, in one shot. So uh, it was a prolonged, uh, situation uh, that took a toll on our department and uh, certainly uh, no more so than the families that uh, lost their loved ones that night. I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. So um, Brookline, where you are now, that's more like right outside the city? Uh, actually, Brookline was a, a neighborhood of Boston, uh, just like Dorchester and Jamaica Plain, Austin, Brighton. Uh, so we're surrounded on three sides by Boston. Uh, so we're, we're very much a metro uh, department, uh, um, albeit uh, we're, we're kind of an enclave to ourselves with Boston all around us, but uh, have a great uh, working uh, a, uh, relationship with Boston Fire and the uh, Metro Boston Fire uh, services down there. 
Um, they're, they're very much in tune with each other. Uh, mutual Aid Boston, Metro Mutual Aid is really, uh, you know, uh, outstanding. Cambridge, Somerville, uh, you know, uh, Quincy, Newton, all, all of the folks down there, we do a fantastic job of helping each other out. So it's a little different uh, for me in that uh, everyone surrounding us down there is, is a Metro Boston uh, uh, career fire department. So uh, you have a lot of help. Uh, a lot of folks right around you to come and help uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So it's uh, it's interesting. It's a it's a great it's a great change of pace for me. So back to Worcester. Uh, uh, Worcester uh, how big is that? How big is that job? So uh, Worcester Fire Department has 406 uh, firefighters. Uh, so we're the second largest city in New England. Uh, people don't get that. They think you know Providence, Hartford, uh, Portland. Uh, they're, they're all actually smaller than the city of Worcester, but being that we're not the state capital, uh, folks don't really, you know, understand that that's the, the case. So it's a metro-sized department, 406 members. Uh, back in 99, we were still doing 10s and 14s. They've uh, changed over now to 24s. But uh, back in the day, for my whole career, for the most part, um, we, were, we were doing 10s and 14s. Uh, so I know, you know, the schedule here is, uh, you know, uh, one of the things. Uh, so. Uh, in 1999, uh, December 3rd was our first of two night shifts. So we had just come in um, at, uh, you know, 5.30, 5 o'clock. It's a, technically it was 6 p.m. shift change, but everybody gets there a little early. So, um, you know, the, we literally had just gotten to the station, uh, started to, you know, prep the meal for the night. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys weren't even in uniform yet because uh, the, the box came in. Uh, just after 6 p.m., uh, and uh, so we were we were right at change of shift. So uh, um, you said you had on your ring. Is that normal staffing, or what? Uh, what does your yeah? Do? <laughs> I wish it was. Um, no, I mean uh, back back then in 1999, we were we were probably at the highest staffing we had had in a long time. Um, you know, certainly. Uh, we had uh, on paper four and one uh, on every rig, but uh, the reality was that uh, for the most part, uh, you were three and one, and uh, we would also ride down uh, depending on the, the uh, number of folks that, you know, coming into the shift, you, you know, to two and one. So minimum manning for the engines was two and one, uh, and as well as the ladders, which was, you know, generally speaking, um, the, the vast majority of the times we, we were at two and one. Um, being just before Christmas, uh, end of the year vacation wise, um, it was just an anomaly that, that, that night I was able to keep all four of my firefighters and didn't have to ship them out to another engine or across the floor. Uh, the station that we come from headquarters, uh, there's two engines and a ladder there. So, uh, it was, you know, more than usual to ship across the floor and not unusual to ship to another station. But, uh, for whatever reason that night, engine 16 had four, uh, ladder two had four, and uh, I had my full complement of five. Everybody was in. There were no long-term sick leaves or IODs and no ship outs that night. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Uh, typical staff, typical people say like a, three guys, especially especially that time, the other firehouses, three guys on a rig. Um, right. So uh, then what were you doing, like two engines and a truck? Or did this get this got a pretty good response, right? Four engines and a, two trucks, or yeah. Back then, our uh, initial response to report a fire was uh, four and two with the with the chief. Uh, so four engines, two ladders, rescue company um, uh, as well, and then the chief uh, um, district chief. So this uh, originally came in as a full box assignment: uh, four engines, two ladders, uh, heavy rescue, and uh, the chief of uh, the district chief. Uh, quickly went to a second alarm. Uh, the chief would, at the time, Mike McNamee, who everybody knows, uh, and uh, made you know an incredible uh, leadership uh, that night. Uh, is and uh, Mike called the called the second alarm from the highway. Uh, you could see the smoke billowing from the top of this building. This was an iconic building in downtown Worcester. Uh, sat you know literally just 60 feet off the highway uh, and towered above the highway, so it was right there. Uh, for everybody to see, and as he was coming down on the box, he he saw the smoke billowing from the uh, the roof of this building and called the second alarm. Uh, and so that would bring basically half the first alarm, you know, another two engines and a ladder, 
and then you, we keep going with that two engines and a ladder, two engines and a ladder till we till we run out of ladders. Uh, and then on the fourth alarm, uh, that's when our mutual aid kicks in. We start to backfill the stations at, at the fourth alarm. So this uh, this building probably had a lot of nuisance alarms to it. Yeah, you know, uh, you would think so, but not not really. Uh, it had been unoccupied for about seven years prior to this fire. Um, as my memory serves me right, um, it, it was it was an unoccupied vacant building. It was not an abandoned building. Uh, so the owner was, uh, you know, a relatively responsible guy. It was in an industrial area downtown where uh, basically after five o'clock, there's nobody around. Uh, and it was boarded up as best as it could be. Uh, but, you know, Worcester is a big city, uh, you know, 200 plus thousand uh, population. Uh, you know, during the day and, and um, you know, the vagrants and the, and the homeless folks, as you know, there were two homeless folks that were used in that building. Uh, you know, they, they were homeless. They weren't stupid. They knew how to get in there and not be seen and how to make it look like it was still all boarded up so that, you know, the police that were doing uh, their rounds and so on uh, didn't obviously know that there were people getting in there. And uh, so, um, you know, for the most part, um, not not a lot going on in there just because it was you know it was vacant and uh it hadn't uh yeah there's a good picture of it there and uh, uh that's a that's an old picture of it but that that's uh that's the uh what we would say the ab corner that's actually a great picture i don't know where you got that one i've never seen that one but um that uh you know that's uh that was that was what we see on arrival so even though you say it's boarded up there's not a lot to board up because there's not a lot of windows in this place. So, um, yeah, so uh, not, not a lot of news. I got this PA journal website after they did their um, investigation, I guess, of, of the gotcha. And um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to grasp, right? I'm, I'm, while, I'm a, while I'm an old guy, I'm not that old to understand, you know, how they uh, really we cold storage of meat, right? So this is like they would take pieces of beef and hang in this thing until it was ready to go to market. Is that or ready to go to? Yeah. Store? So, so originally this was an ice house. So before you know refrigeration back in the early 1900s, um, they they uh, stored ice here, and uh, you would the ice man you know would go around to all of the uh, neighborhoods and drop off a block of ice into people's refrigerators and that's how they kept their you know their food cold and so uh, this was originally built uh, what you see here is actually two buildings that are uh, combined together um, and uh, the original building stopped right where your line is there where you're, where you're showing your arrow uh, and uh, coming forward towards the front of the picture towards uh, towards us uh, or towards uh, uh, the, the loading dock, that was the original building. And then they added on another uh, L shape to the back of it, which is in the distance of your, uh, your picture here, um, a few years later. But back in the early 1900s, they did a great job. They didn't they don't do it like they do today, where they just put a, you know, like a, a rubber mm -hmm. membrane between the two buildings and kind of piece them together. They actually dismantled the outside uh, corner of this building and wove it together so you would never really know that this was two buildings uh, unless you knew the history of the building. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it was, a, it was an ice house for many years and then when refrigeration came in, it was just for general storage of, uh, you know, things that needed to be kept cold. So yeah, meat was part of it, but you know, vegetables and any, anything else that needed to be uh, kept cold and, uh, you know, it would be, um, you know, distributed to uh, restaurants and institutions and so on and so forth from there. So, uh, uh, go ahead, Bobby. So, John, you say seven years before the fire. So, you were on the job when this was active. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it wasn't in my district. So, uh, you know, I, I came on the third alarm. Uh, so, it was two districts away. I was certainly aware of the building, but uh, had never been assigned to that district. So, you know, the night of the cold storage fire, there were many of us that, you know, the first time into that building was when it was, you know, on fire. So uh, I had never been in there before, never, you know, never did an in-service inspection in there, never, never had walked in the, the building. So, John, when they, when they did the uh, addition, 
did the interior layout of the storage locker type configuration, did that continue through the new section as well? No. Uh, no. Uh, so the, the, the second half of it uh, had a little different configuration because instead of being a square, it was a, a rectangle. Uh, and uh, the, the anomaly that you can't see from the outside of this building is that uh, if you're, as you look at this picture, you see those windows on the B side um, where you just were, uh, the, those represent the only uh, set of stairs that goes uh, from the bottom to the top, right where you're, you're, you're doing your uh, pointer now. And so uh, right so, where he is, that's what, that's the B. So there's yeah. the, that's, that's the B side. So those are the only stairs that go to the roof. And, 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 and contiguous from ground level all the way up to the roof. There's mm -hmm. one other set of stairs in the front uh, AD corner uh, that were cut in many, many years ago uh, just to go from the first to the second floor because they took a cold storage locker on the second floor and turned it into offices. Uh, and so that was just an interior stairwell that went from one to two. And then on the seaside in the back there that off the loading dock, um, that only goes up to floor number uh, four. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, to floor number three. Uh, so for whatever reason, they didn't continue that stairway up to four, five, and six. The elevator next to it did go all the way up and the elevator on the uh, B side goes all the way up and down, but those were inactive at the time. Which is fascinating so, because the, the ice houses, I'm a little bit familiar with, my grandfather was actually an ice man back, yeah. in, the, back in the day. He was a New York City cop, but an ice man on the side. And the, the calipers they would use and deliver the ice to people, which is where the term ice box came from. Long, yeah. before, long before the term refrigerator, we call them refrigerators now, but they yeah. were ice boxes. And so, the reason a building like this would be in the center of town is that's where you needed it because the further you traveled away from that building, the more ice would degrade and et cetera, et cetera. Plus the, all of the mercantiles that were selling other vegetables or whatnot, we want the access. That's why the train tracks are back there. A lot of people wondered at the time of the fire, why this building had so much access to it, but that was a focal point of the growth of Worcester. You know, sure. go back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, that building was crucial. And Sean Flynn does a great job in the 3000 Degrees. Um, he also wrote, I believe he also wrote the, uh, the article. Um, yes. Which is wonderful. Um, he did a great job on both. But 3000 Degrees, he does a great job of, of connecting you with the history of that building. And, and uh, hats off to him. But uh, the, 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 now, quick question for you, John. So as we look, as, this is a great diagram for us. So as we walk around, we go A, B, we saw where there was access there even during the fire. The train tracks in the back, how, was it, is that the highway side? Is that where the highway no. side is, C side? Or that's, that's okay, that's D side. D side, yep. Okay, so how is access to those two sides during the fire? Uh, so there was no access really on the D side at all. Uh, there's, a, there's a diner that, that was right along the right side of the D side and then you're underneath you're essentially underneath the overpass uh, right up next to it. So there was really no access. Seaside access was limited to where you see, you know, the two uh, words that say train tracks. It doesn't really go beyond there. Uh, so we had A, B, and about half of C. Wow. Um, one thing I wanted to point out in this picture, Bobby, you asked me about, you know, the layout on the, on the floors of the new side. Uh, you can see the access door that goes between building A and building B. So uh, there's that one access door that goes through. And, you know, when we teach high rise operations, you know, this, I know this doesn't technically qualify as a high rise, but, you know, we tell you, you know, go two floors below, look at the layout, and then you can pretty much figure out what's up above you. Well, that doesn't hold true here. Um, that door goes into different rooms on different floors. So if you did a search like the rescue guys did on floor number six, they got through that door because they made access down the B-side stairwell from the roof, went through the door into the other side of the building, came out, went down one more flight of stairs to five, but that door didn't bring them to the same place. So when they, you know, the thought is when they went to look for their way out again, 
uh, when their air started to run down, they were kind of going back to the same access point they knew on six, but it, it wasn't in the same place. If I could beg one more question, Tony, if, if you don't mind, would you, John, mind describing the, a lot of people don't understand what a cold storage warehouse is all about because they're not as old as we are, or sure. at least John and I. Uh, so um, they're highly compartmentalized and the doors right. have D-ring doors. I believe these were D-rings also, right? Which actually right. flop back flush with the door, right. uh, which, uh, which, which the purpose for that was so that when men and women, when, when folks were working in there, they didn't become encumbered with those doors. But it, it's just a maze of locker after locker after locker. And uh, unlike, yeah, so, uh, unlike anything you'd encounter today. Right. And I mean, and you, you, you go from one room into another room into another room. And the only way to get back out is to go back through those three rooms to get back out to where you first came in. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the size of this building and, uh, you know, the fact that um, they're, they're, generally speaking, if, if you and I get lost in a building, you know, we're going to go to a corner or, or if we know the building to have a center stairwell, we're going to try to make our way to the center and we're going to find our way out. Um, you know, this building doesn't follow the same rules, you know, in, in any modern building, you would find an access stairwell at some point on, on every floor. Um, it doesn't follow here. You have to actually make your way back through a door, through, a, through one room, into another room, out a door, into another room, into another room to find the, the access out. So, that became, you know, the really the biggest challenge for our folks because back in the day in 1999, um, you know, we were we were using a right hand rule, you know, uh, that that was it. The, the, we didn't have, you know, large area search ropes with knotted ropes and so on and so forth. Later on in the fire, someone, you know, got the idea to uh, grab the hauling lines that we had on the trucks and tie off, uh, but that didn't bring you very far, you know. I mean, hauling lines only you know, really good to get you from the third floor of a three-decker down to the ground to haul up a, you know, an axe or a hose or whatever, you know, to the third floor stairwell. Um, so, um, you know, I went up there with my crew to search for the two rescue guys, and I did a right-hand search, and uh, I got to about the third room in and realized, you know, this does not work because there was it was never bringing me back to where I started, it just kept bringing me deeper and deeper and deeper into the building. So, one final uh, construction question, John: What yeah. is the what is the length on the A side and and uh, the D side? What 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 are we looking at in just footage? Any idea? It, it looked to be uh, about three hundred foot. Yeah, off the top of my head, you know, I remember the 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 square, uh, the original square on the A side. Uh, was 88 by 88 by 88. It was essentially a square. And then the um, the second half was about, uh, I'm going to say 70 some odd feet by, uh, I don't know, 90 some odd feet. So, you know, 150 to 100, um, wow. you know, on, on the D side. Somewhere a little short of that, but, you know, in that ballpark. That's a big, and then that's six, a big building. Six floors. So if you go back to the uh, the original picture uh, or an outside view, um, you know when when you pull up as a firefighter, um, you know you 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 look and you try to figure out how many stories are in a building, and and you count the windows. <laughs> you know, so if you're on the A side of this building to the right hand side of this picture, you have no idea. You know. Uh, and when the guys from the rescue squad called, you know, that they were on the top floor, one floor down from the top, I know, you know, in my conversations with Mike Mack, you know, he said, I looked up at the building and I went, crap, I, I don't know how many stories are in this building. There's five, maybe six, you know, uh, but if you come to the B side and you look at the loading dock and then you take the, the one more window, another window and another window, that's four. You can guess there's maybe a fifth one above that, but what is that top piece above that, you know, that marbling? Is that, uh, is that a, an attic area? Is that a loft area? Is that a machine area? What is that, you know? It actually turns out to be another floor. And right at the very top of that 
that picture, you can see a structure right on the very top uh, in, in the center near, near where you see the smokestack. That is the terminus of that uh, uh, stairwell and the um, elevator where the rescue squad, squad guys made their way into that stairwell. So you get a picture, that little wooden structure on the top of the building there. That's how they made their way in. And, uh, you know, you, when we went to, uh, you know, when Chief McNamee assigned folks to do a search, we didn't know exactly what floor they were on. We only knew that they were one floor from the top floor. And that could be, depending on what number you guess, either the fifth floor, the fourth floor, the sixth floor. So we all ended up being kind of, uh, instead of concentrating all of our rescue efforts to one floor, he had to split us up to make sure that he was covering you know, enough area to potentially be uh, where we needed where we needed to be. And that that, you know, was problematic as well. And if you, you know, in hindsight, we go back and uh, what you and I would say was the first floor uh, where that loading dock was when you were in the actual stairwell. Now, I couldn't see it because of the smoke, but um, they didn't start counting one until the floor above that. So you had the, the ground floor, one, two, three, four, five, which really made six stories. And so that became confusing to everybody. The rescue squad said they were on the fourth floor, one floor down from the top. Paul Brotherton radioed that at one point. And if you started at the bottom and you went up to four, you were actually one floor below where they actually were. So. And in the meantime, <laughs> Fire is burning, right? The fire was uh, was yeah. still, still raging in the somewhere in the depths of the building. So the fire started on the second floor in that office area, and um, it had it had about a, a two hour start on us from when we from when we know that they, you know, recorded in their testimony the two homeless folks when they said they thought the the fire started around 4.15, 4.30. We didn't get the initial call until almost 6.15. Um, this fire was oxygen deprived uh, when we first got there. It had fairly well, you know, exhausted the oxygen in that area. As we started to make entry through the B side and the C side, um, up the stairwell uh, on the C side with a two and a half and then up the B side, uh, through the, that, that stairwell uh, to the center core, um, that's when we started to oxygenate this fire and it took off again. Um, six inches of asphalt impregnated cork with four inches of polystyrene and, uh, and polyurethane on top of that. Uh, so, um, you know, it was a class A combustible building uh, with, uh, you know, 16 inch girders and, uh, and columns. Uh, was going to take a long time for this sucker to burn through, and, and it did. Uh, but the fuel load that was on all of the interior surfaces there was really a Class B fire. Uh, when you look at, you know, uh, the asphalt um, being a petroleum product, polystyrene being a petroleum product, uh, the, the, that was, uh, if you see the video of this fire, and you see the black rolling black fire that's coming out of this when you know, eventually it burns through the roof. Um, you would swear you were looking at a, uh, you know, a tanker fire uh, based on the black acrid smoke that was coming out of it. So, um, you know, you've got a six story uh, wood stove with a class B fire in it and you're trying to put it out with a class A extinguishing agent. Yeah, so it, um, as, um, go ahead, as the fire progressed, um, again, um, the was the fire was it i guess it was never in check right with while while these guys were also missing well no no i mean it, it, we were close at the beginning and you know had had we not gotten the report that there were two homeless folks in there and started to do a primary search above um you know we probably would have backed out of this and let it burn you know um but uh, almost simultaneously to when 
the first hose lines were getting into place and starting to make some, you know, headway on the fire is when we got the call for uh, two homeless folks were uh, somewhere, you know, potentially in this building. And unfortunately, back in 1999, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it, if somebody said that they were potentially there, it meant we were doing an all-out search. And uh, that's what we did. And, uh, you know, that led to the two uh, rescue firefighters becoming uh, disoriented, and uh, which turned into the May Day, uh, which turned into an all-out assault to try to find them, uh, which led to, you know, four other firefighters becoming disoriented in the meantime. Uh, and all along trying to fight the fire and keep the fire in check. Uh, unfortunately, at some point on the B side where that loading dock is, sometime early on in the fire, um, somebody opened up all of those overhead doors. And it's like opening the draft on your wood stove, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it, just, it just took off from there. Uh, the oxygen, it got the oxygen that it needed. Um, if, if you look at the top of the building, the only real vent hole that we were able to, to, to utilize was the top of the elevator shaft on that C, D side, um, broke out that elevator shaft uh, window uh, and had about a 14 by 20 hole up there. Uh, but at some point, the products of combustion uh, and the steam and the gases that were uh, being uh, emitted from the firefight overwhelmed the capacity of the hole. So the volume of smoke overwhelmed the capacity of the vent hole, and that's when all of that smoke and all of that heat started to, you know, roll out laterally. And that's what, uh, you know, that's what enveloped uh, the firefighters from being able to see their way out of it. And I think, John, it's important to add at this point that, in 1999, that was standard operating procedure almost across the country. We, yep. we, were, not, we were not deeply versed in, in the work, although Braidwood in the 1800s had been talking about uh, flow paths and we were talking about cool air and low air gravity currents, we really weren't talking about oxygen deprived and oxygen rich fires yet at that point. So, you know, today people might hear you say that and think, well, what was that person thinking? Well, right. We had used that tactic successfully, you know, uh, sure. up up teen million times, uh, you know, and 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 so you know this is one fire where it was ill advised, and and no one on that fire ground, nor I, nor anybody else alive at that point in time, or would claim to have known any better, uh, you know, maybe to limit it a little bit, but. That, to, yeah. you know, this wasn't a, this wasn't a, no, no one responding to this fire was poorly trained or, or reckless or anything like that. Quick question. So as someone's looking at this diagram right now, watching the show, we, we yep. see the A side lines going in, but it was the B side where the initial lines came, came into the fire, correct? Yeah. So uh, the two and a half you see off of engine 12 uh, and engine six coming in. Uh, and then uh, engine one and 13 uh, came through the, the seaside. It was a little bit deceiving um, uh, in, in uh, oh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it, it, it was, it's a little bit deceiving. There was a line that came up through the back door. Um, engine 16 uh, ran it all the way through. So the first floor um, where you saw the loading docks was an interesting place. In the A building, it was pretty well open. Um, you know, it was, it was like any loading dock, you know, it was just this big open space. And so you could traverse your way through there to the back of the building pretty easily. And one of the anomalies of this building too is that the, the ceiling, if you will, above the loading dock and what we knew later to be the first floor was poured concrete. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nothing came down on that area when this building collapses. It collapses down onto the first floor and stops there. So we were operating, and Chief McNamee was operating interior at the bottom of the B-side stairway in that area. And uh, that, was, that was a place of refuge. That, that was fine. Um, you know, uh, it, six, two and a half at one point on that fire in a space you know, maybe the size of an auditorium over there in the building B. Uh, the problem was it was all cut up with offices, so they weren't making a lot of penetration. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, that, that, you know, complicated it just a little bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, Bobby, in, in response to that, too, is that, you know, RIT companies didn't exist in Worcester back then. Uh, it was pre-RIT. I mean, some places had it out west and, and down south, but it hadn't been, uh, you know, adopted nationwide at that point. So uh, when the third alarm was struck and we all came, ladder two, engine seven, engine three, we all arrived on the scene uh, and we were staged. Uh, you know, we were originally staged and then the first uh, maydays came in from rescue one uh, and everybody that was on the third alarm was assigned, uh, you know, somewhere in the building to do a primary search for the rescue guys. Uh, um, when I say we're doing a right-hand rule, we're just doing a right-hand rule. You know, there was no thermal imaging cameras. There were no guide ropes. There were no writ packs. There was no, there was none of that stuff. It was, uh, you know, it, it was just go and try to find them. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what, that's what we tried to do, you know. Um, and, and, uh, and, and not all of you were carrying radios either, right? Wasn't it uh, just, it was like one or two per company? Yeah, two per company, uh, one for the officer, and then there was a second radio. In my case, um, you know, I had a radio and I had two of the firefighters with me. Uh, my crew split and uh, Jay Lyons and Joe McGuirk uh, formed a team. Uh, and uh, Jay was driving that night. So when we arrived, he still had to get dressed and we were getting maydays. So I took my two guys and Jay stayed with Joe and he got – he got his air tank on and put his, you know, his, his uh, gear on and uh, uh, came in. He actually hooked up with ladder two. You can see ladder two just in front of them. They came from the same station as as we did. Uh, and when Tommy uh, Spencer and his crew were were uh, getting an assignment inside, he he hooked up with them uh, and went inside because we were already inside somewhere. We were on the third floor. That was where we got assigned. Uh, and uh, that's how uh, Jay ended up with Tommy and those guys on the on the fifth floor. So, and they had, they had a radio, I had a radio. And um, so, yeah, not everybody had a radio. And as we know today, I mean, uh, for tracking and for listening and for messaging, uh, you know, the radio is incredibly important. Now, so um, I want to emphasize that, uh, that, again, you said that the fire had kind of uh, burned itself out, if you will. Uh, it was oxygen, it was a ventilation limited fire. And then as companies, again, 1999, we're thinking that a lot of uh, venting equals cooling and things like that, that yep. um, let's open the place up. And the other thing, too, I, I think that, you know, they, the, maybe they had gone to a fire the, the tour before or the day before, right? And it was in a two-story house where if you open that place up, there's not a whole lot for, for it to do. So, you know, again, if it worked on that fire, maybe it'll work on this fire. So you think, yeah. all right, we'll open up this one. So that's going to happen. So with that, right, um, and reading reading the, the article, reading the, uh, the after action report, that kind of thing, I can see, and I'm sure we've all been there, right, the, the, the smoke is not heavy. We're walking around searching. We're, uh, we're standing up, right, because, again, it's not pushing yeah. us down. I don't, even have, I don't even have my mask on, but I have it there. So when conditions changed, when conditions changed that quick, they scrambled. Some scrambled deeper into the into the building. Some scrambled to to this the stairwell. They were lucky to find a stairwell. But those that got got disoriented now had to put put their SCBA on. Now had to get that on, and also you know figure out a way to get back to where they came from. So th I can all, I can't even imagine what the what the conditions were again. Um, you say the, the vagrants, right? The, the homeless people, which I'm sure the guys that worked in that area knew that that place was occupied by homeless people, right? So that was already on their mind. There's probably going to be somebody in here. Um, and it, again, these things don't start by, by squirrels, right? Right. They started by somebody who was in there. So yes, I mean, the, the search and rescue was going to, was needs to be done. And then not only that, the search, the search for the fire, because it sounds like it was pretty difficult to find the fire. And then one uh, it actually, we found the fire right away, Tony. The, the, the fire was found right away. That was, uh, that was, that was pretty, um, pretty quick. Um, the two main lessons when I teach, you know, the cold storage fire, the, the two main lessons that I believe, you know, were major contributing factors here were, um, you know, 
we did not have specific policies, procedures, SOPs for fighting a commercial building fire. And it is, it is absolutely necessary for, you know, fire, fire departments in an urban environment to have, uh, you know, an SOP that it, it, it puts you in a mode to say, this is a commercial structure. This is not a residential structure. You cannot use residential tactics and expect it to work on, on, a, on a commercial structure. Uh, and that was a lesson early on that, you know, we, 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 we unfortunately learned. The other is air management. Um, you know, back in 1999, um, you know, and, and, I, and I do this and I've done it to thousands of folks and Bobby's heard me do it in my, my presentations. And I say, you know, as a firefighter, what is usually one of the first things that tells you it's about time to start getting out of the building? And inevitably, the answer is the low air alarm starts going off. And I go through a take about 20, 25 minutes in the presentation talking about, as, as you pointed out in your SCBA drills, the fallacy of the low air alarm uh, and uh, the, the, the false uh, narrative that we've been told as firefighters for years that, you know, I started on 30 minute bottles, you know, uh, and 30 minute bottles meant that you had about 15 minutes of air you know, 15 to 20 minutes of air. And, and you know, that's a lie. You know, it, it's an average, you know, and I always say, uh, you know, anybody do, do scuba diving, you know, I'm going to take your regulator away and I'm going to tell you that you got about 15 minutes, good luck, and see, see what your reaction is, you know. But that's what we did to firefighters. And we said, yeah, you're going to get about 15 minutes. And then when your low air alarm goes off, what was the lie they told you then? And that was, oh, I've got five minutes, you know, and, and that's not really true. If you do consumption rate testing, it's different for everybody. And if you go 30 miles into this building, you need to get 30 miles out. And so, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that those guys that were up there searching originally searched until their low air alarms went off. We hear it in the transmissions that they're making their first calls and their low air alarm is already going off. Um, I think we've done a good job over the years emphasizing that that is not that is not practical, especially in a commercial building fire. You know that uh, I know we've you know we've lobbied NFPA for a longer you know um, longer time frame, a third, a third, a third, whatever you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, it it doesn't matter to me what guidance your department uses, as long as it has some guidance and everybody knows what it is and, and follows it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if it's fifty percent, it's fifty percent. If it's a third, a third, and a third, it's mm -hmm. what it is. You know. Um, there was just no way to get to get back out once your low air alarm started going off in, in the complexity of this building. John, you raised some really important points that I think Tony drives home in his in his May Day Monday drill. Uh, consumption rates: the average firefighter operating you know, doing work is about 100 liters per minute. The bottles rated at 30 liters per minute, which is basically what you'll consume at rest and not under any stress. That came from the mine safety people. So right. back, back then, I don't know if you recall or could, can even remember, we, you and I came on, it, they were not positive pressure uh, right. face pieces, it was pressure demand. So that's probably what your guys had. And we all were carrying those 30 minute steel bottles. And they were really, they had about 1500 liters of free gas in them. So you could figure while working, you had about 15 minutes tops. And that's if your conditioning was you know, pretty average. If you were an athlete, it was less than that because they can breathe faster and they can breathe deeper and they tend to. So consumption rates are, are very personal, but 100 is a good rule of thumb. And for years, John and I and others have tried to lobby to get bottles rated by how many liters of free gas they have. So a 30-minute bottle would be basically a 15-minute bottle to us because it'd be 100 liters of free gas. A 45-minute bottle would really be about a 24-minute bottle because there's about 2,500 liters of free gas in there that you can consume. So, you know, until, we, until we're successful in that lobbying effort, and I'm never going to give up until, until we're all gone, um, I, I think it's a good effort because that was exactly the basis of the lawsuit that uh, Derek uh, Martin's widow uh, brought against um, a man, a SCBA manufacturer uh, in the death in St. Louis of Rob Morrison and Derek Martin uh, at, 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 the, at that, that fatal fire. And she won. Um, now, I don't know, you know what she won, but it, 
It didn't encourage people to change the, the nomenclature, which I think for someone like John and I and, and other people who train, it's not a trivial thing. It's an important thing what we tell people. And we tell people it's a 45 minute bottle or a 30 minute bottle and it's not, that's a problem. That's a real problem. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm not saying we're ignorant men and women, we're anything but, we're some of the brightest folks in the world. But, you know, when you're young and you hear something and that's what you hear, it, it can create a model that you'll carry for a long time. And to John's point, it, five minutes, it, it, the low air alarm does not mean you've got a round trip ticket. It, it means that you're in real trouble. And, and I think we've done a commercial. I think we've done a good job, Bobby, over the course of the last 10 to 15 years to educate firefighters on the necessity to, uh, you know, ask for help and don't be afraid to call the Mayday. Uh, you know, you and I have both been, you know, out there for a long time saying, you know, if, even if you think you're in trouble, you're in trouble. You know, and don't be afraid to call that Mayday and, and to, you know, re relieve the stigma of that, um, you know, uh, and, and, to, and to just keep hammering folks uh, about the, um, the fact that the, their SCBA is their lifeline. It's the only thing that distinguishes us between, you know, that, that person inside, that civilian inside and us is that we can breathe and they cannot. Uh, and, and once that runs out, your advantage goes away. And uh, I can tell you, you know, uh, and, and uh, Tony alluded to it earlier about the, the swift nature of this fire and how fast the environment changed inside, the, inside that building. When I went in with my crew on our first round of, of search, um, we had, I was on the third floor. So that smoke layer had to come down through the sixth, fifth, fourth, and to the third floor. And I was, you know, I was going underneath smoke to about 18 inches off the floor. Um, and, and so everything above me was charged even further than that. And, um, and it was that you know, thick, was, dark black smoke you were describing earlier. Yeah. That, that stuff that you can almost feel, you know, you couldn't like, see, you couldn't see anybody's light even in front of you, you know? So, uh, it, it was black, acrid, nasty stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was hot. It, it was basically it, it like a tire. Really it's basically like the walls were lined like t with like tires almost. If you can think of it that way, that polystyrene and that cork and that urethane, when that stuff burns, it's just, it's just terrifying how dark it is. No, no doubt. So sorry, Tony, and, you had some other questions. I know you wanted to get to John. It's okay. I think um, we've done a good job. I would really like to, to take a, a, a minute here and uh, talk about the guys. Tell yeah. Me, uh, uh, um, that so many times we, we do these things and we talk about line of duty desks, you know, and guys have uh, W6 stickers on their helmets and, you know, yeah. maybe they know because of um, what's well, Dennis Leary, right? They might, they might know that there was something with that, but do they really know who these guys are? So and one of my missions in the Mayday Monday is for us to know about these guys. So you had two, you had um, uh, McGurk and you had uh, Lions, right, on your rig with you. Right. And uh, Tommy, Tommy Spencer and Tim uh, Jackson also came from my station. Uh, and of course, you know, Paul and Jerry, I knew for years and years as well. But, uh, you know, just to, to go down the, the list, so to speak, Tommy Spencer uh, was a lieutenant on Ladder 2, and uh, he was a consummate family man. Uh, his daughter and my daughter were very close friends in junior high school. Uh, and we spent a lot of time together. He was my senior man when I first came on the job on Engine 9, and uh, he taught me how to be a fireman, you know. He taught me the real stuff, you know, about, you know, what it was to do the daily check and how important that was. And uh, But, you know, he also, you know, uh, found time to, you know, be a tremendous dad to his three kids. And uh, his son Danny is on the fire department now, and uh, his son Pat is a fire protection engineer. Uh, and his daughter Casey works with uh, uh, deaf uh, children as a teacher and uh, just a fantastic, fantastic guy. Uh, his wife Kathy, um, sweet, sweet family, great folks. And, uh, uh, you know, Tommy was the kind of guy I looked up to as a senior man, but also as a role model as a father. And, uh, you know, he was, we, we, would, uh, we would leave the station in the morning and go out and play nine holes, and then he would do more 
in the in the time frame between playing nine holes and getting back to the station that night than any person I ever knew in my life. You know, I'd go home and take a nap, and he'd tell me about the twenty things that he did around. You know, built a fence and you know, uh, walked the dog and did fourteen other things. Just a great, great guy. Um, Timmy Jackson was a uh, Vietnam War vet uh, and a uh, Harley guy, and uh, he, he had done uh, uh, about uh, either 12 or 18 years on the rescue squad in Worcester and uh, had paid his dues and was really a, a bigger-than-life kind of guy. He, uh, he, he, was a, he was a good practical joker. He was uh, one of those guys at the firehouse where if you were new, you better watch out if Tim was around because something – Something was going to happen, kind of those old practical jokes that we can't do anymore, which is, uh, which is just fine, too. But uh, Tim was, uh, uh, you know, uh, served his country and uh, served his department really uh, outstanding over the years. And, uh, you know, then uh, and Paul Brotherton, uh, Paul and I worked together as firefighters at headquarters for many, many years. He had six sons. Um, and his wife, Denise, six sons. And uh, I think at this point, five of the six sons are, uh, are on, the, on the fire department. And, um, you know, great kids, all of them, uh, really a tribute to their dad. Uh, Paul was another great guy. He, he uh, obviously a great family man. And uh, uh, he had the locker right next to mine for many, many years. And I had four kids and he had six kids. And uh, it was kind of a joke as to who was going to stop first. And uh, um, he beat me. He had six boys and uh, great guys, great, great men and great firefighters, all of them, as well as, as their father was and their, their great legacies to their dad. Um, Jerry Lucy uh, was the one that I didn't know quite as well as the rest of them. I worked with Jerry for, for years on off shift. He was just in a different shift than I was in. Uh, but uh, by all accounts, uh, worked at the fire academy, uh, was, was a fireman's fireman. Um, he has a, 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 a son, Jerry, uh, and uh, Jerry, his son, Jerry, is also on the job now uh, and is also, uh, I believe, now assigned to the rescue squad uh, like his dad was. And, uh, you know, just a tremendous uh, tribute to uh, uh, his family and to, um, uh, to uh, his father. Um, Joe McGuirk, uh, Joe and I went to high school together. Joe was a year ahead of me in high school. He joined the fire department a little later in life. He was a contractor. Uh, his uh, brother was on the fire department and his grandfather were on the fire department. And uh, he, uh, he joined uh, a, a little bit later. He, he had just gotten on the job a couple of years before that. Uh, and um, he was assigned to my truck. And uh, like I said, he was a year ahead of me in high school, but um, another you know, great family man, fantastic guy. Uh, give you the shirt off his back. He was actually in the middle of uh, um, redoing my kitchen in my house at the time of the fire, and uh, he, uh, um, you know, he uh, he was he was just a giver like that. You know, he was uh, just a sweetheart of a guy. Uh, and uh, Jay Lyons, uh, Jay and I came on the job together. Uh, Jay uh, was a younger guy, um, uh, had never been married, but uh, he had a sister and his parents that uh, he uh, was very. Uh, very devoted to, and uh, Jay had left the fire department for a little while, about five years in, and had gone on to uh, the dark side and had become a state police officer for a number of years, uh, and then returned to the fire department, uh, saw the saw the error in his ways, I guess, and uh, returned to the fire department, uh, and had been back for a few years prior uh, to this fire. And uh, Jay and Timmy were both uh, posthumously uh, promoted to lieutenant. They were both on the lieutenant's exam. Uh, at the time of their deaths, and so they were posthumously uh, promoted to lieutenant after after the fire. And uh, you know, um, tremendous loss, tremendous loss for you know uh, the department, uh, for the t the city, uh, but you know more especially for those families. And uh, you know, uh, I, I can't say enough about the grace and dignity with which the uh, the widows and uh, the families of those. Uh, uh, brothers have uh, comported themselves over the years. Uh, tremendous, tremendous folks. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, every year around this time of the year, my heart goes out to them and uh, uh, I pray for all of them. And uh, John Davies, who uh, uh, unfortunately died uh, in a building collapse another 12 years later, Chris Roy and uh, Jason Menard and, uh, you know, all brothers that uh, gone, gone too soon, but uh, uh, certainly uh, gave their, you know, gave their all and, uh, you know, we owe them a debt of gratitude. 
while not uh, something that you want to leave, uh, this is a beautiful memorial to the to the men uh, that were lost. And uh, did you the firehouse is built on the site? Is that right? Yeah the uh, the owner of the uh, the uh, property ended up uh, donating the land to the to the city. Uh, it was a relatively controversial um, you know uh, <laughs> thing to build the firehouse there. Um, some folks didn't want it there, but um, you know it, it's turned out to be a tremendous tribute to them, uh, and um, you know it, it 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 will forever be uh, the uh, you know, the legacy uh, to them to have that firehouse there. So well, I wanted to uh, wrap this up here with uh, the skill drill. Um, this is, while, um, you know, nothing can, uh, can, can replace those guys, hopefully we can learn something from, from the tragedy. Um, John, you, you mentioned a big one, which uh, is a May Day Monday uh, staple, if you will, is uh, SCBA, SCBA air management. That's the one tool, right? That that when it when it runs out, you can you can die. Uh, the other thing about that is that it's so important. That's a, such an important tool that everybody gets one, right? There's only one. As we run all kinds of EMS runs, but we only have one EMS bag. We don't run that many fire calls, but everybody's got an SCBA. So it's really up to you to understand, to, to be familiar, to be intimate, you control your level of knowledge and comfort with the SCBA. This month's skill drill, again, uh, is, a, is a popular one here at the Mayday Monday uh, headquarters. Um, what we're going to do here is, we, I call it a shake and bake. It's a throwback to a uh, confined space training we used to do in Virginia, where you get like 25 people and we pile all their SCBAs in one room and you'd have to go in and find them. Um, since we can't really, you know, get 25 people, we do it a company at a time. Uh, here I've taken four SCBAs. We take the four SCBAs, we break them into their parts, throw all the stuff into a room. Now, uh, we let them keep their face piece because again, with all the stuff passing things around, we put their face piece on, we black it out, and then we send them into the room to go find the pieces. Uh, you can see here, I got some pictures of the guys heading into the room to go find the SCBA. Once they get in there, they locate, locate all the parts. This also is kind of a place where you see the guy who uh, takes charge kind of comes out, right? Because he gets in there and he'll find everything and start handing it out to people. But, but uh, they get in there, inside there, they, they find the SCBA, they put it together. They, um, uh, what they're gonna find though is that out of the four cylinders that are in there, two of them are empty. So if you got an empty cylinder, you need to go find a buddy that's got air. And when you find that, you find that guy with the air, you can uh, buddy breathe and then exit. Tony, my, sli my slide is still the building slide. Oh, is it? Yes, sir. Not changing on my screen. John, is it changing on yours? No, it's not on John's either. No, I still have the uh, building slide. Let me see what I can find out here. I wasn't sure. If they were seeing something else than we were. <laughs> yeah, I hope they were seeing something else than we were seeing. We, we weren't seeing the SCBA drill. Because I, I know that I know what you're, that, I know, I've seen it, it before, sir. Yeah, now, now we have the shake and bake drill up, yes. There you go. There you go. Much better. All right, so we got these pictures here. We got the guys, again, that go in. We can, we can add some stress to it by turning on the pass alarms. Right, so when they get in there, they find the the, uh, the cylinder and the harness. They gotta reset the pass alarm, and then then they uh, put the thing together. Not a real stressful. Should be should be really easy, but you will see that uh, there's some some guys who aren't even comfortable in their turnout gear, let alone with the with the SCBA. But it's a good quick drill. Again, I know it's not realistic. You're not gonna go to a fire and and uh, find your SCBA scattered all over the building, um, but it's really, really emphasizes the need to know all the parts, how it goes together, uh, kind of a stress, right? Controlling your stress, controlling your breathing, and then uh, knowing all the, the components, how to buddy breathe, and then working as a team to get out. So that's what I, uh, well, that's this month's drill. You guys can, uh, can find that when the uh, Mayday Monday comes out on Monday. Uh, Fire Engineering will send it out. Again, DC Fire and EMS will send it out. 
You can get that on the Twitter and the Facebook. Uh, we have Peter. Peter's going to add that to the uh, fire engineering site. So you guys can get it. Bobby will retweet it. And he'll send it back out in Facebook so everybody can get the skill drill for this month. Um, I, I really thank you guys for uh, coming on. John, uh, that was some really great insight. And I've never really heard about uh, with the Worcester fire. Again, it's always been there. And, and we know that six guys died. We know that, you know, who went in, that kind of stuff, the, the crazy building. But you provided a lot of good uh, – Good insight and, and and simple simple things you want to get from this whether it's um, with the uh, air management I really think that that's important and hopefully the guys will take that to heart and uh, practice practice what they're they need to ne never discount a commercial structure fire you know um, statistically speaking we lose more firefighters in large numbers at commercial structure fires and it is less than usually less than 5% of our experience base. And that's part of the reason why, you know, so it's vitally important that, you know, chiefs like us take up the, the mantle and make sure that we have specific SOPs to address those, you know, those uh, gutches that you're going to, you're going to end up with with a commercial structure. Fire. And if you'd let me for a second, Tony, a quick shout out to our good friend, Billy Goldfeder, who put out a wonderful uh, secret list this week that has, unfortunately a devastating list of December tragedies, Our Ladies of Angels, the Worcester Fire, the Buffalo tragedy, uh, Keokuk. Keokuk. Um, and, and all of them have lessons that, uh, you know, in one way or another, we can never let down our guard um, ever. Uh, you know, uh, and even when our guard is up, we always need to remember that um, what we see in hindsight you know, was not what the folks that arrived there uh, had in their mind. What, what they knew to be true and what we now know to be true can be radically different things. And so always step back and before you, you know, say something you'll regret or say something foolish, try to understand what they understood to be true and what they were trying to accomplish. And so here we had a tremendously complex building with an active fire that everyone knew was an active fire that knew didn't start. It, was, it wasn't a lightning strike. And so they knew they had a high probability of a potential rescue. And, and they all acted in the highest tradition of the American Fire Service and subsequent to the May Day, an even higher level, uh, if, if, you, if it's even possible, um, the heroics and and. We all know the story of Mike at the door. And if you want to profile and courage, there, you can look no further than, than Mike. And uh, I, I heartily suggest you read Sean's book and, and uh, the article. If you want to read something shorter, uh, Sean's article, which has Billy has been gracious enough to provide links to. Um, you, you know, the, the humility that you have to bring to this job, first and foremost, uh, if you think that you know better than the folks who were there, or you know better than the guy or gal sitting next to you, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, the, everybody's got something to add and something you can learn from. And, um, you know, moments like this, this month and, and having John still willing to share with us and, and John still willing to be out there on the front lines leading um, speaks volumes about what the city of Worcester uh, can be proud of. Kennedy once said, a nation is judged not only by the men it produces, but by the men it honors and by the men it remembers. And, and I think the same can be said for the outstanding fire departments like Worcester and Boston and DC and Philly and, and the list goes on and on. Every fire department in America has produced people who uh, embody the greatest qualities and virtues that a man or a woman can, can ascribe to. And so John, I wanted to thank you personally. I know this is not an easy conversation for you. It never is. I've watched you over the years and Mike, and, and uh, I know how tough it is for you because these men were not casual acquaintances. Um, you know, maybe Jerry, you didn't know as well, but uh, you knew him fairly well. And the other men you knew as family, practically brothers. And um, I, I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart because when you speak, um, it, it's hard. Uh, if you didn't well up listening to John describe those men, then 
you don't have a soul. Uh, I, I can't imagine. Um, so I wanted to thank you, and, and I want to thank everybody for listening to this. And, and take the time, pull up Billy's secret list, um, go through some of those, read some of those uh, reports. Uh, you know, try to walk a, a mile in those shoes, and and remember that there, but for the grace of God, go any of us. Um, and, and at any moment, He can take you. And and it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. You could just be standing under the wrong spot of the building at the wrong time. I mean, uh, look at the natural gas explosion that took out uh, Chief uh, um, Bay in the New York City. <laughs> I mean, just a just a standing in the wrong spot, and and it wasn't wrong by any measure of wrong or right. Just um, this is a very 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 dangerous job, and it's always going to be a very very dangerous job. And if every minute that you're able while you're working you don't do something to learn more about it you're stealing from yourself and perhaps you're stealing your own future so john i, I thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for everything you do i hope to see you again soon um uh, and and uh and, and you as well tony and thank you for allowing me to sit in tonight tony i really appreciate it i'm glad we could get it together john it was quick quick notice quick turnaround for you to to be with us today I appreciate it. Um, you're going to have the link. Uh, all, all your listeners are going to have the link to the, to the uh, story, to the uh, article that was the short version of the 3,000 degrees, and also the link to the um, NIOSH uh, after action report on the Worcester with, the, um, with this month's May Day Monday. So uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, uh, Pete. Thanks, uh, Fire Engineering. Appreciate that. And we'll be back next month for another May Day Monday. Thanks, guys.